Hue and Cry was scripted by T.E.B. Clark and directed by Charles Crichton. It was released by the Eden Studios in 1947. These days, Hue and Cry is often referred to as the first of the classic Eden comedies, but this is misleading. It certainly wasn't considered to be a comedy at the time, more of a hugely enjoyable boys' adventure story set in a rubble of a bleak, bomb-scarred London. Nevertheless, when people do talk about Ealing comedies, what they're generally referring to are indeed those scripted by T.E.B. Clarke, and Hugh and Cry certainly points the way towards the form, with its well-written script, ensemble cast, and a pervasive realism through the use of genuine locations. In my opinion, T.E.B. Clarke's first true Ealing comedy comes two years later, in 1949, with Passport to Pimlico. 1949 also saw Ealing release two other comedies, uh, Whiskey Galore and Kind Hearts and Coronets. And it's from that year that Ealing's enviable reputation for comedy really stems. Hue and Cry starts here. Camera sweeps up the Thames at this point. This is Shabwell Basin. It's one of the few stretches of water that remains from the original London docklands. It's implied that the choir practice we see at the beginning of the film takes place in the church behind me. That's St Paul's Church, called St Mark's in the film. Though actually once the boys pick up the discarded comic outside the church, filming has moved a bit further upriver to Wapping, Piers Head, and it combines what was then the entrance to the flourishing docklands with back projection and a studio set. As a large rough hand closed over. The Trump comic is central to the plot of Hue and Cry. One of the gang, Joe, played by Harry Fowler, becomes enthralled by a story in it. He doesn't want to be seen by the rest of the gang buying a coffee, so he comes here to purchase one surreptitiously. This is Holden Viaduct. Holden Viaduct was opened by Queen Victoria in 1869. It was a bit of a favourite with Ealing and appears in several of their films. Here we are in Covent Garden. Joe thinks he's onto something when he spots a lorry here which has a number plate which matches the number plate on a lorry illustrated in the trunk. He becomes convinced that the accompanying story is in fact coded instructions from a master criminal to his minions. In those days, Covent Garden was a thriving fruit, vegetable and flower market. And Joe's able to continue his investigations when he gets a job with a market trader, Mr Nightingale, played by Jack Warner. In fact, most of the sequences in the film set in Covent Garden were shot in the studios at Ealing. But those majority of the buildings that we do see are still here. Covent Garden still thrives now as a tourist attraction with its bars, restaurants, pubs and street entertainers. Before it was a market, Covent Garden was a fashionable Italianate square. And just one building survives from those 17th century roots. That's Inigo Jones's St Paul's Church. This is the famous church, the Actors' Church. It actually doesn't appear in the film, but its churchyard does, and that's what you can see here behind me. One of the groups of children running towards Ballard's Wharf to overcome the gangsters at the end of the film run through this churchyard. One of the most difficult locations to pinpoint is where Joe and his gang live and play. It was largely a desolate bomb site when the film was made. There's one huge clue and that's the twin-towered power station you see in the background of many of the shots. It is actually Battersea Power Station. It only had two towers when Hue and Cry was made, though at the time of filming, work had started on doubling its size. Joe's first port of call in his investigations is the flat of Trump writer Felix H. Wilkinson. The interior is a studio, of course, but the exterior is genuine. This is number five, Iverna Court, and as you can see, it has barely changed over the years. Joe becomes convinced that his conspiratorial suspicions are correct when Felix confirms that his latest story has been tampered with and tampered with by incorporating a coding system he himself invented in a previous story. Wilkinson provides the late great Alistair Sim with a wonderful cameo which surprisingly would prove to be his only film at Ealing. Ah, Otto, come, Otto. And boys, don't forget Nicky the Knock. Joe and the gang decide to stake out the office of the Trump to find out who it is guilty of tampering with the stories. The office is just around the corner, in fact, from Holborn Viaduct, where we were earlier. Behind me, you can see a statue of Prince Albert. 
This is Holborn Circus, and you see that statue in the film. In front of me, the largest of Christopher Wren's City of London Parish churches, St Andrews. And to the left of it, that is Holborn Viaduct, where Joe brought his comic. And to the right, St Andrews Street. And it's down there that the office of the Trump is situated. Let's go and take a closer look. The office block behind me is on the site of junior publications, the publishers of the Trump. And it's over there that Joe first meets Norman, uh, played by Ian Dawson, so who's chief Trump, contact mate? within the yeah. publishers. Why? It's here that Joe keeps a watch out on the mysterious Rona, played by Valerie White. Joe moves around during this stakeout, and incidentally in some shots you can see a striking tower in the background. It's no longer there. It used to be part of the Congressional Hall, which used to stand in Farringdon Street, where the Labour Party was founded in the year 1900, but it was demolished in the late 1960s. The gang do follow Rona, and after a false start, which sees the gang jumping off a bus in Gunnersbury Lane near Acton Road tube station, they finally get on a trail and track her here to Kingsway. It has to be said that continuity is all over the place once Rona turns into Kingsway, making no sense in terms of real topography. Nevertheless, there are several still recognisable sites in the sequence, including the now disused tram on the pass at Southampton Row and the clock on the Cheltenham and Gloucester building. Also recognisable is this building at the corner of Parker Street and Kingsway. Rona goes in there before crossing a road and that allows us a glimpse of the distinctive frontage of Africa House. In the end, Joe persuades Felix to plant a store in the Trump which will lure all the various gangs of London to a riverside location so they can be overwhelmed by the children of London who will also be summoned to the spot. That area is called Ballard's Wharf and it actually stretches over to my left, right down to the river. In those days, it was an empty bomb site with just a few warehouse shells left behind. But what you can see behind me is on the fringes of Ballard's Wharf in the film is St Michael Paternoster Royal Church, a beautiful Christopher N church famed these days as the burial place of four-time Lord Mayor of London, Dick Whittington, of Dick Whittington and his cat fame, though the tomb is now lost. We see it in a rather sorry state in the film because it was gutted by a bomb in 1944 and only restored in the mid-1960s. So here we are on the river side of Ballard's Wharf. Ballard's Wharf itself stretched from the bridge behind me, which is Southwark Bridge, to the bridge that's in front of me, Cannon Street Railway Station Bridge. And so this is where the children overwhelm the gangs of London. Cannon Street Railway Station looks much the same as it does in the film, despite much rebuilding over the years, because it's retained its original outer walls and its riverside towers. And it's alongside that that there's a half-demolished warehouse where Joe attacks the gang supremo and finally brings him to justice. <laughs> Thus ends the film. Since so much of Hue and Cry was shot on location, it now provides us with an invaluable record of a London devastated by war. But the charm of the film is it sees that destruction largely through the eyes of children who relished it as a dangerous but a wonderful adventure playground. Yeah.